Tonight we begin our four-part study on the life of Mary Magdalene. Although Mary is not mentioned much in the Bible, she is in fact a prominent figure. Mary Magdalene is mentioned by all four gospel writers, and that is not always the case for important figures. For example, Luke, Matthew, they hardly ever mention people like Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus. But yet, Mary Magdalene is mentioned by all four gospel writers. Mary Magdalene also followed and supported Jesus Christ throughout much, if not most, of his ministry. Unlike the apostles who fled away from Jesus Christ, Mary was with him at his crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, Christ appeared first, not to his own family, not to the apostles, but to Mary Magdalene. But she is not only a prominent figure, but she is an example of godliness for us. To paraphrase the words of the Apostle Paul, be ye followers of Mary Magdalene as she follows Christ. And the Lord willing, over the next four sermons, we'll come to realize why is she such a prominent figure and why is she such a godly example for other believers in the Lord. This evening, however, we begin with her conversion. Is that not how we often begin when we meet someone new for the first time? Maybe they come to church. Maybe they're in your home for hospitality. And you say, tell me about yourself. Where are you from? What's your background? How did you come to the Lord Jesus Christ? And it's a wonder and a beautiful thing to hear the testimony of a brother or sister. And so who is Mary? Where is she from? How did she come to Jesus Christ? Today we will consider her testimony under three headings. Mary before Christ. Mary saved by Christ. Mary serving Christ. So first of all, Mary before Christ. Who is Mary Magdalene? This is an important question. For 2,000 years, there has been so much error and confusion over this woman. If you read newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post, every spring, they'll run articles about the Gnostic Gospels. And in the Gnostic Gospels, it says that Mary Magdalene was the head of of the apostles. And Jesus Christ only explained the gospel to Mary and not the other apostles. And the other apostles were jealous of Mary. And Mary held the truth and the secrets of the universe. And that's wrong and erroneous. These false gospels were written in the third century, not by any apostle, not by Mary Magdalene, not by Peter, and they have a radically different worldview, believing materialism is evil, and the creator of the material world is evil, and only the spiritual is good. Yet, newspapers still run these articles every year. But in the visible church, there's also been error. In 591, Gregory Great, he preached a sermon. And in this sermon, he identified Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, and the sinful woman of Luke chapter 7 as one and the same person. And he taught this one person was a wicked harlot. And ever since then, in art and stories and sermons, 
people have presented Mary Magdalene as the woman of Luke 7 or the woman of John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery, and pictured her as a harlot. Completely unbiblical. Luke chapter 7 mentions the sinful woman, and then Luke chapter 8 verse 2 identifies Mary Magdalene as a different woman. In John chapter 12, he identifies Mary of Bethany, and then in John chapter 19, a different woman. And in John chapter 8, of course, the woman caught in adultery is never given a name, and it was not Mary Magdalene. And another modern error about the identity of this woman comes from conspiracy theorist books. The most well-known, of course, being Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code that says that Mary Magdalene was secretly the wife of Jesus Christ and had children and their lineage is here to this day. Blasphemy. And erroneous and being refuted by historians and theologians very easily. So, so much confusion. Who is Mary Magdalene? Well, you'll see in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, the physician is revealing Christ going about preaching the gospel and who is with him during this ministry. He mentions his disciples, he mentions other women, and he mentions in verse 2, Mary Magdalene. Mary is an ordinary Jewish name. Miriam in the Old Testament, Mary in the New Testament. Magdalene simply means someone from the town of Magdala. If you have maps in the back of your Bible and you turn there to Israel in the time of Jesus Christ and you go to the northwest of the Sea of Galilee, you'll see a little spot there that says Magdala. And it is important to know that in Joshua chapter 19, when the land is being lotted out to different tribes. It says in verse 32 that the children of Naphtali, and then in verse 38 that Magdala is mentioned there in the Hebrew form. Note that, we'll mention it later. Magdala is in the land of Naphtali. It says in verse 3 that the women supported Christ out of their substance. The word substance here is the same word used of the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. It means riches, wealth, possessions. And we have an idea now of who is this woman. She's Jewish. She's brought up in the covenant home. She would have been taught from the Holy Scriptures. She would have confessed the Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. She would have heard the orthodox truths of the Jewish religion as revealed through the Old Testament Scriptures. She would have went to the synagogue. You can relate to her. Covenant children. Young or old, just like your upbringing. Now, she wasn't poor like my background and maybe many of yours. She's a woman of substance. Maybe her father had a prominent job in the shipping industry, which was the main business of Magdala on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. We can't be certain, but we know she was wealthy and rich. But what's important for us, what was her spiritual state before Christ? Look what it says in verse 2. Evil spirits and infirmities. And then mentions Mary Magdalene, out of whom seven devils. She was under the power of of darkness. There were seven literal devils influencing and possessing her. And the number seven in the Bible means completion. 
She was completely under the power of darkness. When you read the scriptures, the power of darkness affects different people in different ways, and we're not given the specific influence here. But we must ask, how does a nice, young, covenant child come under the influence and power of darkness? It doesn't tell us. But if you read your Bible and you understand the Bible in real life terms, maybe Satan came to her. She learned her catechism. She memorized her Bible. She enjoyed going to the synagogue. But as she grew up in her formative years, her teenage years, she's a young girl with money. And what's the temptation there? The devil using the flesh with the world as a carrot before the donkey and bringing her away further and further from the things of Jehovah until she is in complete darkness. Covenant children, is this you? You're catechized. You're taught the Bible. You have family worship. You attend worship every Lord's Day. And when you were young, you have the common operations of the Holy Spirit. That's the influence of the Holy Spirit upon someone in the visible church which restrains them from great evils and gives them natural desires for the things of religion. And we usually get the common operations of the Spirit from Hebrews chapter 6, speaking of those who were unconverted, but influenced. Once enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted of the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come. And you enjoyed worship. You enjoyed talking about God. You enjoyed meeting up with other Christians. But then now you're 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and onwards. And now the desire is dying out. Has Satan come to you as well? Is the love of the world in you? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Society and all of its temptations. The promise of happiness and joy, pleasure, status, gadgets, gizmos, reputation. And he's come to you. And where you were once so close to the kingdom, you didn't enter it. Because Satan was tempting you with the world, just like Mary Magdalene. My dear friend, my dear friend, if you do not come to Christ early, Satan will be at your door to make sure you do not come again. This is why young child, young teenager. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy, thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Come early. Don't wait. There's not an age that you come to Christ. You can come at Christ at two or three or four or five or six. Christ comes in Mark chapter 10 and there's young children around him and the disciples say, no, no. Don't bring your young children to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ rebuked his own disciples. Suffer, permit them, let them come to me for such is the kingdom of God. So young child, do you desire Christ? 
Is there something of faith in your heart? But maybe there's something in you saying, I don't want to come to him. I'm too young. I'm not experienced yet. Do not think like that. Come in your youth. Come early and Christ will receive you. We don't know her exact experience, but she did come under the power of darkness. And before Christ... This is the spiritual state of every single human being because of sin. And under the power of darkness before Jesus Christ, it means four things. Your spiritual father is the devil. John chapter 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He's a murderer, he lies, and the truth is not in him. That's the natural man. He might be suited and booted with a smile and nice morals, please and thank yous, gives to charity, but he's in darkness. The devil's in him because he loves the things of the devil. Murder. Someone says something against me, I'll destroy their character. Liars, fibs. It also means, secondly, that a slave to sin. Christ says in John chapter 8, He that sins is a slave to sin, cannot do anything but sin. Even when they sing the Psalms, though that is something God has commanded, Because the source of the heart is polluted, the rest of the river is polluted. And so when you do something that is God's will, the source of your heart, sin, pollutes even the singing of psalms. Thirdly, under the power of darkness is misery. You read the Bible, what was it like to be influenced and possessed by the devil? In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says, Christ went about helping those who were oppressed by the devil. When the Canaanite woman came to Christ in Matthew 15, she described the experience of her daughter as being vexed, grieved by the devil. And that's our lives by nature. Oh, how we seek joy and purpose and things, alcohol and women and wealth and status, and you get it and you're miserable. You look for something else, it's great for a moment, the fleeting pleasures of sin, and then it's gone. Why, oh, why do celebrities and rich people are so miserable? The dream job. Since they were this high, they've dreamed to be an actor or a a musician or a singer. And they get it. And they're successful and they're miserable. Because they're under the power of darkness. And fourthly, when you're under the power of darkness, you're under the condemnation of God. John chapter 3 verse 19. This is the condemnation. Light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than than light because their deeds were evil that's how you stand before God your sins your rebellion your covetousness your sabbath breaking your idolatry your sexual immorality the secret things of your thoughts of the heart which no man can see but God crystal clear and what happens to those who are under the power of darkness God's just and he's fair. How you sin is how you're punished. Matthew 8, 12. The children of the kingdom, covenant children who do not come to faith in Christ, they will be cast into the outer darkness. Under the power of darkness, sin, punishment, cast into the outer darkness. Darkness just has the idea of being absolutely terrified of God as he punishes you for all eternity. 
Have you ever walked in a city and it was getting dark and darker and then it was pitch black? You can't see anything. You don't know what's around the corner and there's this natural fear that comes in you. That's just a drop of the ocean of terror knowing therefore the terror of the Lord as he punishes you for your sin. This is you who are unconverted. This was you who are now converted. This was Mary before Christ. But we have a conversion story here. We have a testimony. And praise be to God. It says in verse 2 that Mary was healed. She was saved. She was delivered. And if we ask four questions of her salvation, we can glean much comforting truth for our souls. First of all, who healed her? Who saved her? It's a basic question, but it's the most important question you'll ever ask in your life. Here in Luke, it just simply says, He, and you know who He is, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one in verse 1 who was preaching the gospel. In Mark chapter 16, verse 9, it says, Jesus cast out seven devils out of Mary Magdalene. Jesus Christ saved Mary Magdalene. You're not saved by things. You're not saved by benefits. You're not saved by righteousness. You're saved by a person, Jesus Christ. I've been meditating on Luke chapter 1, 2. Rich, rich stuff in those two chapters. And in Luke chapter 2, Jesus Christ, as a young infant, has come to the temple, and Simeon has taken this child in his arms, and he says, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. His eyes are seeing Jesus Christ. And as he sees Jesus Christ, he sees salvation. This is how many sinners remain in the state doubting, lacking, can, lacking assurance, or never coming to Christ. Because the devil and the flesh are taking their eyes off the person who saves towards benefits and things. Have you ever read John Bunyan's testimony, his own biography, The Grace Abounding in the Chief of Sinners? I didn't like it one bit. Well, that's not true. That's not fair. I didn't like it for like 60 pages. Because very early he's under conviction of sin. And page after page after page after page after page, he's looking for benefits. He's looking, am I elect? Am I called? Is there righteousness for me? Is there peace for me? Is there mercy for me? And his eyes are not on the person, Jesus Christ. And he goes through a cycle of self-condemnation and self-lack of assurance and he keeps on looking inwardly for things and benefits to possess. But then one day he's walking and out of nowhere he thinks in his mind thy righteousness is in heaven. Christ Jesus person is my righteousness. It's not me. It's not what I do. It's not my conviction or degree of conviction. It's not my repentance or my degree of repentance. It is Jesus Christ and I trust in Him person alone and what He's done work and therefore I receive the wonderful gospel benefits of justification by faith alone. And when we seek benefits 
apart from Christ, there is only that cycle, doubting, lack of assurance, self-condemnation. So get your eyes off benefits. And by faith, look solely upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And why is it Jesus Christ can come to this woman of darkness and save her? Because of who he is and what he does. Who is he? He is God. And who is God? 1 John chapter 1. He is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. And Jesus, the eternally begotten Son, he is the brightness of his glory. And he has come into this world as the Christ and as the mediator. And as the Christ and the mediator, who is he? Luke chapter 1 verse 79. Through the tender mercies of our God, the day spring from on high has shined his light in the darkness. I am the light of the world. He that believes in me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Or in the language of Acts chapter 26, verse 16, sorry, 18, he has come to, quote, open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. Are you in your sin? Are you under darkness? Come to the light. Come to the light like a, a moth to the flame, like a fly to the bulb. Come. Your sins, your debauchery, your condemnation, come to the light. Christ shines in the midst of your darkness and says, come. And if you come by faith, just as Jesus Christ is the light of Mary's world, he will be the light of your world. Just like you, brother and sister. Is he not the light of your world? But then secondly, why did Jesus Christ heal her? Doesn't tell us, does it? That's why you need scripture to interpret scripture. Let's go to another person who was under the power of darkness. Let us go to Mark chapter 5, the demoniac. Why did Jesus Christ come and cast out the darkness from this man? And when you read Mark chapter 5 verse 19, it says this. He was moved with compassion. I love that word. It's one of my favorite words in all the Bible. It's a very vivid picture. The Greek has the idea of the inward bowels being moved with the depths of mercy. Have you ever saw someone just suffering in a bad state and you were turned inside out? It was heart-wrenching. And all that compassion, mercy, and pity went out to them. That's Christ. And he heals because of that. In Mark chapter 1, the leper, no one goes near a leper. No one touches a leper. You stand a hundred feet away, unclean, unclean. And Christ is moved with compassion and touches him and heals him. And do you want to know why Christ has compassion? Because he's God. Everyone has an idea of God. Who is God? God is compassionate. Psalm 86 verse 15. Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. And Jesus Christ has come to reveal God to us. He is compassionate towards sinners. Brother and sister, is that not us? In our sins and in our condemnation, he has come and he has showered you with his compassion. And to fellow sinners, 
He stands here before your eyes and he says, I am moved with compassion and I will heal you too. Thirdly, when was she healed? Doesn't tell us. Was it in Matthew chapter 4 where it says Jesus Christ came to the land of Naphtali? Or was it Mark chapter 15 where it says Jesus Christ crossed the Sea of Galilee and came to the town of Magdala? We don't know. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when you were saved, but that you are saved. Many covenant children struggle. There was never this road to Damascus experience. There was never this black and white experience. This is an illustration that it doesn't matter. Where there's never been a time you have never repented of your sins and trusted in Christ alone. What matters is you are saved. The awesome glory of the gospel that saves a Paul or a Mary is the exact same gospel that saves you. So dear covenant child who might be wrestling or struggling or lacking assurance simply because I don't know when, it doesn't matter. Right here, right now, are you repenting of your sins? Do you lay down all your righteousness? And do you come to Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Then he's yours. And he's yours forever. Fourthly, how was Mary healed? Again, it doesn't say, but if you look at the Bible, interpreting the Bible, Jesus Christ saved her by his power through the word and spirit. In Mark chapter 16, verse 9, it says, Jesus cast out the seven devils. That's a very strong word, cast out. It means to expel, to thrust. Jesus Christ, with almighty power, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, it says, They brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word. And what do we see in verse 1 here? Jesus Christ preaching his word. And then in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, he says, If I through the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, cast out devils. So Jesus Christ, by his power, through the word and spirit, cast out devils. And again, we don't know exactly how it happened, but you can imagine the scene. This poor woman of Magdala, miserable under the power of darkness. No hope, no light, no help. And here's Jesus of Nazareth. And he walks into town. And he preaches the gospel. And then he sees this woman, not under one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but seven devils moved with compassion and casts them out by his word and spirit. And now she is free. Now she is delivered. She has been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the dear Son. And there's no more misery because there's Christ and the forgiveness of her sins. She's no longer a slave to sin but a slave to righteousness. She is no longer under the devil as a father, but now by the adoption of sons through grace, God is my father. And it's the same for you. That you were once in misery and darkness. And the gospel, Romans 1, the power of God unto salvation. 
Jesus Christ in him crucified. Repent and believe in him. Power. And you are under the word. And that day, just like Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, it did not come in word only, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And God commanded the light to shine out of darkness and shined in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, and you were filled with light. You were filled with light. And there was freedom as you were delivered from the wrath to come. There is now no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. As far as east as from the west, so far as he removed our sins. He has delighted in mercy, says the prophet, and cast all our sins into the depths of the sea, and we are free. His truth set us free. What a saviour! What a redeemer! The light of your world. But salvation is not only the forgiveness of your sins, as glorious as that is. Salvation is not just justification by faith alone. Salvation is also transformation. You see, Mary is born again. She is a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. Is that not how Edwards describes conversion? It's a new world because you've got new eyes. New thoughts with a new mind. And with a new heart, there's new desires and there's a new life. And what a new life we see in Mary Magdalene, verse 3, where she and the women, but our focus, Mary Magdalene, it says, out of their substance ministered, served Jesus Christ. Why did she do that? Why did Mary Magdalene now dedicate her life to serving Jesus Christ? Out of her substance, out of her possessions, her wealth, her riches, everything she had, to you, O Lord. The reason why is because Christ is in her. That's Christianity. Christ in us. And who is Christ? Mark chapter 10. The disciples are not acting consistently as Christians in the kingdom of God. Selfishness. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? Let me put myself first. Let me sit on your left hand and your right hand. Christ says, no, no, no. In the kingdom of God, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Listen to me. This is what you do. The Son of Man never came to be ministered unto, but to minister. And when Jesus Christ is in our hearts, Christ forms us to minister and serve others. And he gives us that spirit-wrought grace, love. Love doesn't seek self. Love doesn't puff self up. Love is sacrificial and serves another. And because Christ is in her and she loves Christ, she serves him and his ministry. What do you do when you gather for church? What are you doing at this conference? Are you here to be served or to serve? On the Lord's Day, do you turn up to church and everyone else is putting out tables and chairs and microphones and you're just there being served? Are you standling, standing and you see there's things to be done? Maybe there's a, there's a visitor and no one's speaking to them. There's a Christian struggling and no one's coming to encourage them. Or someone spilt a cup and the water's just standing, they were lying there. Are you there to be served or to serve? True, vital, mature Christianity is Christ-like. 
You know the gospel, Romans 1 to 11. You apply the gospel, Romans 12. And you lay your own body as a living sacrifice to serve the Lord. So if you are someone who says they're true believers, and you are at this time showing selfishness and not service, repent of your sin. Stop seeking to be great. And look at Christ. Follow Christ and follow Mary Magdalene and serve your Lord and Savior. How can we serve Jesus Christ out of our substance? Well, let's just clarify before we apply. Your substance might be the woman of two mites. Not very much in the eyes of the world. But Christ sees it and is so, so pleased. Your substance might be a million mites. How do you serve? They served Christ specifically by hosting him so that he is, an or, he is able to go around preaching. 1 Timothy chapter 5 says that we are to give honor to elders, but especially those who bring the word of God and the preaching of the word. And it says that the laborer is worthy of his hire. Are you given of your substance, not minimal as possible, of your substance for the gospel ministry? Do you value the glory of God, the honor of Christ, the saving of souls, and the edification of the saints that you'll gladly give of your substance to support ministers in the free church continuing? Would it be wonderful that there'd be so much money in the pot that we have to send men here, there, and everywhere as full-time church planters, as full-time missionaries to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ? So you can serve the Lord and Savior out of a love for Him and giving of your substance, whatever that may, that may be, to the gospel ministry. And Christ will be very pleased with it. Or maybe it's something more close to home here. Maybe your substance says you don't have anything, but you have a roof over your head. And you have food in the cupboard and you have food in the fridge. First Peter chapter 4, use hospitality without grudging. God has given us these things as stewards. And you can take a brother or a sister or a visitor. You can bring them into your home. You can host them and help them and encourage them in the Lord. Or Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. So many different gifts given by the Holy Spirit. Maybe your gift is encouragement. You just have a sensibility when a Christian is just not feeling quite right. And you're like David to Jonathan and Jonathan to David. You can come up to that brother or sister and you can serve Christ by encouraging someone. Whatever your gift is, use it and serve Jesus Christ. Sisters, Mary Magdalene's a woman. And she is a godly, faithful example for you to serve the Lord out of your substance. You serve him by raising children. Your seminarians, your theologians, your economists, your doctors. And children are a heritage of the Lord. They're on loan. And uh, for us, as, as, as the prophet says, as a godly seed for the church. And you love them. And you teach them. And you disciple them. And you give your best out of your substance. And you send them off to serve Jesus Christ. That's how you serve him to his pleasure. Older sisters in the faith. Titus chapter 2. Young women, newly married, newly have children, Come alongside. Teach them to love their husbands. 
Teach them what it means to be godly and faithful. Widows. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 10 shows those who are widows indeed, if they are to receive financial support from the church, there must be evidence of a serving life. And it's described like this. <clears throat> Well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet and has relieved the afflicted. Just visiting someone, encouraging someone, giving them a meal when they're sick. That's serving Jesus Christ. Or maybe it's someone like Susanna Spurgeon. She's sick. She can't get out of her home. She's pretty much bedridden. And she struggles. How can I serve Jesus Christ? She starts a ministry. She starts sending letters and books to ministers who are poor and cannot afford good resources. And she served Christ. You don't have to preach the word, sisters, to be someone who serves. Ignore the evils of feminism. And go to your Bible for godly, faithful service as you minister unto him out of your substance. And this is Mary. This is where she came from. This is what happened to her. This is her testimony. And you who are in Christ, it's your testimony too. You're changed. You're new. You love holiness and godliness and service. And as we continue on, we will see she is someone who is especially full of devotion to Christ. But that's for tomorrow night. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our Father, we simply give praise to the glory of thy grace and bless thee for Christ's salvation in Mary Magdalene and for salvation in us. O oh, may we all be men, women, and children who were under darkness, but now in the light. Encourage, assure, save, and edify us. In his name, amen.